Welcome Rich Kids family and a special welcome to those who are new. Please go on to our Facebook page if you want to see what's happening in the life of the church. And for all previous content, please check out our YouTube page. Uh, this evening at 5, we will be having a live group uh, session, Connect, at 5. And for those that are interested in becoming members, our classes will be starting soon. Why bother membership? Epic kids, I hope you are ready, because that's up next. It's good to be with you, Epic family. We look forward to having a whale of a time. Oh, you and your jokes. But I have a better one for you. Oh, do you? Yes, I do. Okay. How do whales keep fit or stay healthy? I don't know, maybe like the different strokes when they swim? No. They actually take in a lot of vitamin C. See oh, the no! <laughs> okay. <laughs> that wasn't bad. And in today's story, we will be talking about a man who was very slow. And he didn't like to obey. I think we're all in good company dear. Hey kids. And sometimes when we don't obey, it comes with a lot of trouble. Hey guys, how's it going? What are you guys up to? Like, what are you doing here? Hey, it's what like, I can't I... see the sign on the door. What's the sign? It said filming in progress. Um, Please do I'm not so enter. sorry, but like, I, I'm allowed to go into any room. I'm not the pastor. No, 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 you can't. Can you not see that we're filming? Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oops, okay, I'm sorry. You see, even pastors need to obey. So now where were we with our story? On to this week's story. Oh yes, this week is a whopper of a one. So we've asked some of you to help tell it. So over to our news presenter, Tyler. Good morning, this is Dylan. I'm filling in for Tyler for RFC Bible News. Now, the breaking news today is that one of our local residents here in Gath, the prophet Jonah, was told by the Lord Almighty to go to Nineveh, the capital, capital of Assyria. Now, this is where everything gets interesting. It was reported that Jonah told the Lord God, it ain't gonna happen. Now, that's mind blowing. How does the prophet of the Lord have the courage to say such a thing? Well, we spoke to one of our local travel agents, Savannah, from the Desert Travel, to give us some insight. The prophet Jonah came to me to ask about the possibility of traveling to Nineveh on the Pony Express. I told him it's a distance of 1,300 kilometers. The ponies can only cover over a distance of 120 kilometers a day, and you would need to change ponies every 50 kilometers. So that would make the journey A, very expensive, and B, very, very long. I told him he was looking at a 10 to 15 days journey. He looked at me in horror and said, No way, Jose, but my name isn't Jose. That would be one angle that would explain Jonah's audacity in refusing to obey the Lord Almighty. We have called in an analyst to look at that exact question to help shed some more light. Over to you, Joshua. This is Joseph not Joshua, never before in the history of Israel has any prophet dared to give the Lord God a flat out no. It would appear Jonah has huge issues with the Assyrians and their cruelty towards the Israelites. He doesn't want the Ninevites to be let off the hook. Perhaps he's missed the point that he serves a merciful God who loves everyone. Thank you for that analysis, but what we do know is that Jonah headed in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh and boarded a ship bound for Tarshish. Well, this is where things got really weird. We have a report from our TV crew, so take a look. This is Jonah. Uh -huh. Jonah was a prophet. That means it was his job to tell people what God told him to say. Yep. One day, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh because the people of Nineveh were doing bad things. Uh... But instead, Jonah ran away. Where are you, please? And went to the port to board a ship, going the other way. He was hoping to get away from God. Oh, he sailed for a place called Tarshish. While he was at sea, 
God sent a great and powerful wind over the sea that caused a storm that seemed like it would break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the sailors tried everything they could think of to save the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah was sound asleep. So the captain went down and said, how can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will help us. Then the crew figured out that Jonah was the reason for the storm. And they asked him, who are you? Why is this happening to us? Jonah told them who he was and that he worshiped the one true God who made the sea. Then he told the sailors to throw him in the sea so the storm would stop. No, why? The sailors still tried to escape the storm, but it was no use. Uh... So they asked God for forgiveness and threw Jonah into the sea. The storm stopped at once. Whoa! The sailors were amazed at God's power and they vowed to serve him. Now God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Uh, great. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and nights. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish and God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Uh, yuck. God told Jonah again to go to the city of Nineveh to tell them what God had said about them. I get it, I get it. I get it, I get it, said Jonah. But do you get it? Jonah learned two very important lessons. Number one, you can't hide away from God forever. I am around you, behind you, in front of you. I hold you safely in my hand. You can't escape from me. And remember, my right hand will always hold you close and guide you. Oh, I remember those words. They're from the verses in Psalm 139. It's good to know, but funny how we think, like Jonah, we can escape God. And the second thing that Jonah learned is that disobeying always causes chaos in your life. I mean, look at what Jonah had to go through, all because he didn't obey. How would you feel if you were trapped inside a whale's belly? Listen to his desperate words. I sank down to the bottom of the mountains. I thought I had died and gone down into the grave forever. You really have to face up to things when you are stuck in the belly of a whale. It's so dark inside this whale And I'm lost at the bottom of the sea I was a fool to run from you Now I know just what you want from me In the belly of a whale One day has gone by I promise to be true And all you ask I'll do In the belly of a whale Oh please hear my cry Never will I hide Your word will be my learned his lesson and this is what he said oh yes my god i will do what i have promised and i will shout thankful praise sometimes we have to learn the hard way just like jonah did so remember kids it's always better to listen to your parents and to god the first time and this brings us to the end of our series talk to the animals we've so enjoyed learning about the animals in the bible you might have even spotted a common thread if you remember a few of the questions that we asked, for example, who are you going to listen to, Balaam? And finally, he chose God. Then last week with the shepherd, we learned we need to listen to the shepherd's voice. And this week, it was Jonah who learned listening to God is the better way. We have a song about obeying to play us out. Abides with 
happy in Jesus, but to trust in full Me home, 
here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever plug me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. a song I know it well a melody that's never fading on mountains high in valleys low my soul will rest my confidence in you alone there is a song I know it well, a melody that never fell on mountains high, in valleys alone. My soul will rest, my confidence in you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning. We give you glory and honor and we praise your name. 
at such a time as this, oh God, we put before you our country. We put before you our leaders, our president, and his supporting cabinet. We thank you for them, oh God. We pray that you would guide them as they rule and govern us in ways that are just and pleasing before you. Lord, we pray for all those that are suffering with the coronavirus, those in hospitals, those in homes. We ask and we plead for their healing in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh God. We pray for the hospital staff, the doctors, the nurses. Won't you protect them, Lord, as they look after the sick. We want to pray, Lord, for the loved ones in our church who are grieving, O oh God, grieving over loss. May your peace comfort them in these difficult times, O oh God. May you heal them, may you strengthen them. Lord, we also pray for those who are ill. May you heal them, may you strengthen them. We thank you for hope that is found in your word. So we pray that in this time your word would be preached, O oh God, with power and that we would receive it, O oh God, with humility and with meekness, and that it would change us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the finished work of salvation. We praise you as your word is preached today, O oh God. May it strengthen us. May it renew us. May it revive us, O oh God. All this we pray and ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning, Rich Grace Family Church, and welcome to Church Online. I hope you're nice and warm on this very cold day in Johannesburg, and that you've got a nice blanket, hot water bottle, or something to keep you warm. Firstly, thank you for your prayers uh, for us as a family. Um, firstly, as we went through our own uh, dose of COVID uh, earlier on in this month and have been recovering ever since, uh, be safe and uh, follow all protocols and uh, trust that the Lord will uh, spare you from that experience. Uh, be in prayer also for all of those who are going through uh, their own experience with COVID and, uh, and those who are grieving the loss of loved ones uh, as a result of this uh, uh, COVID uh, disease that is inflicted upon us. Uh, may God have mercy and may God help us through this very, very difficult time. This morning, we're going to be uh, continuing in our series in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I, I just trust that this will be a blessing to you, as it also has been a blessing <coughs> excuse me, to me. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 is a, a glorious chapter that we, that we can explore um, in, in so many different ways. And our focus text this morning is going to be uh, chapter 1 and verse 11. Now, uh, many of you uh, might be parents watching the sermon right now, and perhaps you would understand uh, and empathize with me a little bit today when I say that there is no privacy or no ownership of anything as a parent, right? There is no sacred, sacred space or sacred time with kids around, um, and uh, th this can be uh, fun sometimes, right? Um, in, in my house, though, I thought there was one sacred item that, that no one else would touch, no one else would think of using, uh, and that is my toothbrush. Something that I own, that I possess, that uh, no one else would use. Well, as, uh, as I would have it, I was completely wrong about that, um, uh, and uh, let me explain a little bit why. Um, one of my kids, uh, who shall forever not be named, mistook my toothbrush as their own. So I don't know why, but our kids uh, decided to move into our bathroom and that they wanted to kind of brush their teeth in the mornings and in the evenings in our bathroom. I'm not exactly sure why that is the case, hence the no privacy and no sacred space scenario as well. Uh, but uh, I was brushing my teeth. Uh, in, in, in the morning one day and uh, my daughter who will be forever unnamed came into the room and said dad why are you brushing your teeth with my toothbrush and i said uh no 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 this is my toothbrush 
And at this very moment, we both realized for the very first time that we were using the same toothbrush. Oh, my heart sank. I felt sick. Oh, I can't believe that I had fractional ownership of my toothbrush with my daughter. That's pretty gross, right? Um, that's something that uh, I will never, ever forget. And now we make our kids uh, write their names on their toothbrushes or color them in a, a unique color so that we all know which toothbrush belongs to which person in our house. Maybe you've had a similar experience. I hope certainly that I'm not alone in this way. But to get a bit more serious and, and kind of down to, to how this applies to our text this morning is simply this. There is no fractional ownership with God. There's a modern day heresy that, that we can accept Jesus Christ as savior in our lives and then kind of postpone obedience to him as Lord. You know, that we can share the same toothbrush with God and the devil and remain untainted. God's ownership of our lives changes everything that there is about us. And the book of Ephesians speaks a lot about this, and particularly chapter 1 sets the foundation for the rest of the book. Jesus as Savior goes hand in hand with Jesus as Lord. Our lives have to be forever changed. As we look at the book of Ephesians, we see that chapter one, in many senses, is what we would call the theological prelude uh, to the rest of the book. The foundation that it establishes is an important underpinning uh, for Paul's teaching in chapters two, right through to chapter six. And so chapter one becomes the introduction in many senses and the underpinning. Chapter two speaks about what it means to have this new life in Christ. Chapter 3 uh, deals with that theme as well. Chapter 4 speaks about unity in the body of Christ. And then, of course, Paul takes that and makes it personal and looks at our own personal standards, um, our new life to replace the old life. And it also goes on and, and explores how the gospel cha changes and challenges our relationship as well. Husbands, wives, children, servants, and masters. And so the whole of the book of Ephesians speaks about some of these themes that are introduced in chapter one. And so if you look at chapter one and verse one, we have the greeting where Paul greets the believers at Ephesus. And then what, what Paul does is something quite unusual, which we don't see uh, very often, is that he, he opens up with words of praise and words of thanksgiving. Uh, in verses uh, three to verses six, we see uh, Paul speaks about God's sovereign choice in salvation. In verses 7 through to verse 10 of chapter 1, he speaks about God's wisdom and provision of redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 11 through to verse 14, the pericope or section we will focus on today, he speaks about the assurance of the Holy Spirit and our own inheritance as believers in the Lord's Christ. And then again ends verses 15 through to 23 uh, in thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has this prayer, beautiful prayer of spiritual insight that is prayed in this section as well. But before we dive into this text that we're focusing on in our main verse is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. And the section we're going to focus on will extend through right through to verse 14. And so I hope that this would be uh, an encouragement and a blessing to you. But three questions for us as we start this morning. Number one, are we faithful to God alone? Are we faithful to God alone? or fractional ownership of our lives. Chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul addresses his letter to the faithful saints in Ephesus. And the simple question is, are we faithful to God alone? 
Are we faithful in our relationship or are we adulterous? Are there other parties that are coming into what should be a monogamous relationship with Jesus Christ? Secondly, are we content to be in Christ? Are we satisfied to be in Christ? Is Christ the one who fills us to overflowing? In verse 3 of chapter 1, Paul says that Christ has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Do we know what it is like to live in the abundant life of Jesus Christ? Do we share in that abundance? Do we know what it is to experience that full sense of satisfaction that Christ is in us? Number three, what obstacles to our own spiritual growth and blessing do we have? Verse 7 of chapter 1 speaks about the fact that we have redemption in him, the forgiveness of our sins and all of our trespasses. What trespasses have become obstacles uh, to your own spiritual growth and blessing in Christ Jesus? These three questions, I'd like you to reflect on them and just think a little bit about them. Maybe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about one or two areas of your own life that you need to think about and adjust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we faithful to God? Are we satisfied with Christ alone? Uh, and do we have sin that is an obstacle in our own spiritual journey? Let's take a moment right now and pray as we start off with uh, looking at this passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing opportunity and privilege that we have today to come to your word and uh, to listen to your word. I pray, Father, that, that you would speak through your word to us today, God, and, and that you would challenge us, that you would move us from, from where we are, God, to where you desire us to be. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible inheritance that you have given to us, Father, for the great gift in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can experience and enjoy together. May we not take that for granted. I pray, Spirit of God, right now, even in this moment, that you would speak to us, God, as we are separated by space and, and, and in time right now, Lord, that you would just, uh, even through this video message, encourage us and bring us back to yourself, I pray. Speak, Spirit of the living God, we are listening and we are attentive. And all God's people say, Amen. And amen. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 1 in the Bible, and uh, we're going to be looking at verse 11, and I will read from 11 right through to verses 14. Paul says, We have also received an inheritance in him, predestined according to the purpose of God, or, or the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in God, uh, in the Messiah, must bring praise to his glory. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession of to the praise of his glory. That is God's word for us this morning. And I encourage you uh, even to read it in different translations so that you can uh, just uh, ask the Lord to speak uh, in different ways to you as you study this passage of scripture. Firstly, who is Paul speaking about in this particular passage of scripture? <coughs> Excuse me, Paul, Paul starts off in verse 11, and he reminds us that he's speaking to the Jewish nation. We have an inheritance. And, uh, and then he moves on and he speaks in verse 13 to, uh, <clears throat> to the Gentiles particularly. And he, he speaks about it in the sense of you. You, when you heard the message of truth, of course, he's speaking to the Ephesians here and the Gentiles who have received this gospel as a result of the faithful proclamation 
of the gospel. He then goes on and he speaks about in verse 14 uh, of our inheritance. Again, speaking not only of the Jew but of, or of the Gentile, but of the fact that both and together can experience and receive this inheritance from God. And so here Paul is speaking to this new covenant community where there is no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no master, no, no, no difference whatsoever. And, and this is, again, from God himself. And so when Paul speaks in, in chapter 1 and verse 11 about this inheritance, what is he specifically referring to as such? When he speaks of inheritance, again, we are made to have an inheritance. This inheritance isn't something uh, that, that we claim. It is something that is bestowed upon us. Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18 says this, I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that by faith in me, uh, Luke says here, they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says simply this, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. He goes on to say, and all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself and has given to us the message of reconciliation. Friend, this inheritance is from God to us. It's not something that we deserved or something that we can demand or as our own right. It is something that is fully from God. And so salvation really is God's business. It's got nothing to do with us. It's nothing we can demand. And again, in verse 11 here, we see it is an inheritance in him, in Christo. In Christ, as Paul speaks about constantly in this chapter, to reiterate that Jesus Christ is God's Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament Jewish expectation of the coming of a Messiah who died uh, <clears throat> as a sacrifice uh, for, for once and for all, uh, for uh, Every single person, the sin of the world was laid upon him so that through the sacrifice and atonement for sin, once and for all, we can experience redemption in and through the person of Jesus Christ. But this, Paul says, is predestined according to the purpose of the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will. I, don't, I want to encourage you not to get so tied into this whole argument of predestination or election um, or, or anything like that. I mean, imagine you're a child on Christmas morning and your father has, has just placed a gift in your lap for you to open. In the back of your mind, you're thinking perhaps of all the wonderful things that you had on your Christmas list. You know, PlayStation 2, or oh gosh, PlayStation 4, I think it is now. I'm a little bit outdated with those kinds of things. And, and, and as you open this gift, you quickly realize that it is not anything that you asked for. You, you didn't ask for what your father gave to you yet. You find that it is the most interesting and delightful, amazing gift that you have ever seen. In fact, of all the gifts that you've opened, this becomes your favorite present of all time. Did your father force you to take the gift or to like the gift as if you were some kind of robot? Not really. Uh, you, you kind of decided that on your own. Did, did he make you enjoy that gift against your will? No. But in his wisdom, your father planned for that day, for that moment. He predetermined to give you that gift out of his own love for you as his child. And it was precisely in the giving of that gift that he also then gave you the desire and love and joy over that particular gift. And so when we look at the book of Ephesians, 
uh, chapter 2 and verse 8 in particular, uh, we are reminded of the fact that it is by grace that we have been saved. Through faith, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. This gift doesn't originate inside of us. This gift is given by God. It is from God. It is our, uh, our, ours to receive, if you like. But this gift, of course, uh, is given to us and it requires our genuine faith, our believing, our enjoyment of this particular gift. And so this gift is from God. The salvation that we receive, this inheritance we receive, all that we have, all that we possess comes from God. God is the giver of all good gifts. But this gift is also our possession. You see, the gospel leads to our salvation. It is through Israel, through Jesus Christ, but it is, it is our salvation that we get to enjoy our inheritance. But of course, we realize the fact that Paul is speaking about here, firstly to the Jews, that the gospel was first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. We see, we see this in the uh, in the book of Romans in chapter 1, where Paul again speaks about, Do, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You see, the gospel is God's power at work in our lives, right? And then Paul goes on in Romans to argue first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Of course, Jesus and his death uh, is is effective for everyone who believes. But Jesus came for the Jewish nation. Jesus was a Jew. He was born into a Jewish family in the line of David. And if you read the book of Matthew in chapter 1, you see the genealogy of Jesus establishes that fact that he came as a Jewish person in the line of um, of David. And, and the only time really that J Jesus sort of goes outside of the parameters of the Jewish nation is when he goes to Samaria purposefully and he meets a woman at uh, Jacob's well who is changed completely by his, her encounter with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, Jesus was always engaging with the Jewish nation. They rejected him and he died on the cross uh, as the rejected king of the Jews, as they mocked him. Uh, but again, uh, we realize that we are all um, included in uh, the nation of Israel. We are, we are spiritual Israel, if you like, uh, as such. But the gospel was first for the Jews. Uh, and the Jewish nation, if you read Old Testament and the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy in particular, was God's possession. God chose Israel. God chose one man, Abraham, in Genesis 12, and he was blessed so that he could be a blessing to the nations, to the families of the world. And so the gospel here we see is first for the Jews, and it is then for the Gentiles, according to Romans chapter 1. But we, we realize and we see that there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Romans 12, 10 and verse 12 reminds us that the same Lord uh, of, uh, is Lord of all. And it says over here, and he is rich uh, to all who call on him. And so the gospel is for everyone. It's for the Jew, but it's also for the Gentiles. Have a look at Galatians chapter 3, where Paul argues, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. There is no Jew or Greek, Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Listen to this, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then, and hear this, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. 
Now, what I'm not suggesting is what we call replacement theology, where we now say that every promise that was made to Israel, every promise that was made to Abraham now becomes my promise and God has to fulfill that. That's, that's what we call replacement theology. And that's not very healthy or very good because you must remember that the Bible was written to a particular audience to a particular context, but it is for us. And so we've got to be very cautious um, of not just replacing Israel with the church, um, because that's not really biblical or helpful. But we have to realize that we are adopted into, we are now Abraham's seed, we are heirs now, we share the promise and the inheritance, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. We belong to Christ, just like Israel belonged to God in the old covenant. But we have been adopted into God's family. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 puts it this way. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, God's possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Oh, the joy of being God's possession. We are God's cherished possession. God's ownership of our life means that he is ours and we are his alone, fully dedicated to God. And so our experience and our hope is simply this. Uh, that, that we are God's inheritance, that we are fully belonging and possessing uh, or possessed by God himself. Looking at what this, this concept of an inheritance was is important for us to understand, of course. An inheritance was of great importance in ancient society. Many people were in the same trade often as their parents, and they had very little upward mobility regarding careers. Um, you kind of followed in the footsteps of your parents, uh, that's, that's how it worked. And so a wealthy inheritance was greatly desired. And so what inheritance did Paul have in mind when he speaks of this in this text? But the believer's inheritance, of course, is twofold. Number one, it means becoming a child of God. And this gives us the right to expect an inheritance. And secondly, we gain eternity with the Lord, dwelling in his righteousness for all time. And so there are two things when it comes to this inheritance. The one is a future hope, and the second part is our current reality. Let's have a look at this future hope, and I want to read a number of passages of Scripture that I hope will help you uh, to understand what it means to have this expectation of a future hope. Colossians 3 and verse 23 and 24 says this, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. Listen to this, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Whatever you do now, right here and now, do it enthusiastically as, what, as something you're doing for the Lord. You know, whether we're doing things at work or whether we're doing things at school, we have to do whatever we do enthusiastically, not begrudgingly, not with a, a sense of dissatisfaction, but do it enthusiastically because you know that what you're doing, you're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful uh, difference that is, a different perspective it is. Uh, again, reminding us that the Bible says, do everything without complaining or grumbling. How many of us complain and grumble from time to time? We need to be reminded of the fact that we will receive a, re a reward of an inheritance one day. Uh, and so whatever we do here and now will de depend, uh, or sorry, will lead to us receiving a reward from King Jesus later on. Oh, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that day. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this, Praise God, and uh, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy that He has given us a new birth right now into a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It is a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. So we have this living hope right now. We have this new birth right now, but we have an inheritance. And listen to how uh, we see Peter describes this inheritance. It is imperishable. Whatever we inherit here on earth is perishable, right? It can be taken away from us. It can be spent. It can, it can be destroyed um, in, in many ways. It is perishable. Uh, it is not lasting, right? But our inheritance above is imperishable. It cannot be taken away from us. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot just fade away. Secondly, it is uncorrupted. It thirdly is unfading. In other words, this is perfect. It is good in every way. And it is ours for our own enjoyment, right? Peter says, kept in heaven for you. We don't often speak about this, but one of the greatest joys of, of leaving this earthly shell is the reality that we will be with him forever. And that we will enjoy the fullness of the re reward of this life in the life that is to come. And when we go and be with him, there is a reward waiting for us in heaven. What a great joy that is. And so that affects how we live our life, right? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. Now I know, I know that many of us don't see our suffering as light or as momentary affliction. <clears throat> but the reality is that the, the, the affliction and the suffering that we have right now is momentary. It will fade. Whether we're healed or whether we go to be with the Lord, it'll only be for a defined period of time. It is light uh, because Jesus will uh, be with us in this. And what it does is it produces, uh, it produces in us uh, an incomparable eternal weight of glory. It changes our perspective. In the light of eternity, we can endure this momentary suffering because, again, what it produces in us is fruit that will be enjoyed in all of eternity. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, a passage I absolutely love and I'm so reminded of when I go through times of trials and difficulty and suffering, and maybe you're going through that right now, and you need to hear this. You need to understand your inheritance that is to come, and not be fearful of, of the suffering we experience now, or of death that all of us will experience, because it is the pathway to life with God forever. Listen to this. There's a time. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will no longer exist because the previous things will have passed away. If you're a believer in Christ, you have this living hope, the reality that he will wipe away every tear, that pain will be no more, that death will be no more. Why? Because God himself will just wipe away all of those kinds of experiences that we have. And in him, this inheritance that we have will spring forth and we will enjoy the beauty of, of life with him forevermore, life of a different quality, uh, life without pain and suffering. Man, I can't wait for that. Heaven is going to be an amazing place. I can't wait for that. It's no wonder, of course, that, that David in Psalm 16 verses 5 says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant, in pleasant places. <coughs> Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. <clears throat> Maybe that's something that you can say this morning, even that you have a beautiful inheritance and acknowledge that God holds your future 
in the palm of his hand. And so the future inheritance is the reality that we see that is to come. But right now we have a present reality. First Peter in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, describes it as a living hope. We have a living hope as believers of what is to come. We have experienced redemption, forgiveness of sins, this new birth right here and right now, which changes our lives and gives us a sense of purpose, which comes from God alone. What is the result? Well, Paul speaks about the results in chapter 1. And the result is simply praise to his glorious name. Have a look at verse 12. Praise to his glory. Praise to his glory. Why would we praise God? In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of incredible suffering, unemployment, great difficulty in so many ways. Why praise God? Well, we praise God because we are chosen, because we are redeemed, and because we have an inheritance that we enjoy partly right now, but we will enjoy absolutely fully in the life that is to come. You see, the goal of Christ's work was that believers would give praise and honor to the Father. This happens, of course, only because we are chosen, because we are redeemed through Jesus Christ. But the truth is, friends, we have to be fully his. There is no fractional ownership with God. There is no fractional inheritance at all. Are we fully his? Have we given our lives fully over to him? You see, God does not fully, or God does not exist to satisfy every woman, every wish of the believer. The believer exists for the glory of God. When the believer, when you and I are at the center of God's will, he is living a life, we are living a life of fullness and satisfaction and joy. But when we are not in the will of God, there is trouble brewing for us. Living in God's will adds purpose and meaning to our lives. We are going to be for the praise of his glory. During lockdown, some of you would have known if you follow me on Facebook that uh, I bought a beetle and have been <clears throat> working hard, I think, uh, to restore this beetle to its original intent. I'd like to introduce you to my beetle over here. This is uh, Herbie. And, uh, and Herbie, when we got it, looks really good on the outside. Beautiful, nicely, freshly painted, got nice new mag wheels on Herbie over here. But the truth is that although on the outside Herbie is beautiful and looks like every little part has been done properly, Herbie was rotten on the inside. And slowly but surely, we have been working hard to restore Herbie to its full original intent. Now, of course, that includes changing some parts within the engine, changing a fuel pump from an electrical fuel pump back to a manual fuel pump uh, because of uh, the, the carburetor that was getting flooded and needed to be replaced often. Uh, this, was, uh, this was the problem that we had. Many of the parts of Herbie were not functioning the way they were intended to function. They were broken and they needed an overall or a replacement. The reality is so often on the outside of our own lives, we look good. We look like we've got it all together. And sometimes we fool ourselves, even waking up in the mirror saying, you know, you've got this, you can do this, you're good, you, you, can, you, can, you can make it in life. But we are messed up on the inside. The truth is only God can restore you fully. You can't do it yourself. And this passage of scripture reminds us again that we have to come to the conclusion that we are fully his. And we have to allow God to do this work in our lives so that we can enjoy the inheritance that he has for us as his children. Will you allow God to do that deep work in you through the power of his Holy Spirit 
so that your life would bring praise and honor and glory to God as you live it out fully in the purpose of his will? Or will you just live your life your way without fully enjoying the inheritance that can be yours in Jesus Christ? Oh Lord, I pray that, that we would fully enjoy all that we have in you. And God, that this would result in praise and glory and honor to your name. Father, speak through your word. May we be encouraged. May we be challenged. And Lord, as we consider even the three questions we looked at earlier, may we answer them in the right and biblical way. Are we faithful to you? Are we satisfied in you? Is there any sin in our life that prevents us from growing in our relationship with you? Oh God, help us so that we will be more and more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for taking this time to listen. And may you just reflect on those three questions uh, that we had in the beginning of this message. God bless you. Thank you. Was poured at the highest price. 
Every fear was lost, every Sunday raised. When Jesus took the cross, He took my place. Jesus took the cross, He took my place.